Hello and welcome to the RDM podcast. My name is Rabbi Daniel Malinga. What we consume has the capacity to affect us, body, soul, and spirit. To discuss the issue, I've invited two ladies from different ends of the spectrum. Uh, one is uh, Miriam Mimo Esther. You're very welcome. Thank you, Rabbi. She's going to give us her testimony concerning alcoholism. Mm. And then on my left is Josephine Jojo Angel, a chef. Mm. Chef, you're very welcome. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> and of course, we have uh, my co-host, Afimani Moneybags McLean. You're very welcome, sir. Always good to be here. Man. We're just going to good dive to straight back. into the conversation. Eh? Yep. Um, I'm very interested. I've, I've always wanted to have a discussion about this, and I'm glad that we have two people who are going to come from a, uh, from a background of experience. And mm. I'm going to start with you, Mimo. Um, just to get the, the people watching to know who you are, tell us about your story, especially linked to becoming an alcoholic and how you got out of it. Okay, so um, hi, everyone. First of all, um, it's great to be here, Rabbi. Um, I'd like to start from uni because I was never, conf- like when it came to academics at least, I was never confused. I always knew this is, um, for me, I want to go into the arts. And then after that, I want to do journalism and communication. So that was never a point of confusion for me. So when I got to campus, like maybe some of you watching are, um, I didn't really take keen attention to what I was putting in my body. So if it was, oh, we are going to the bar, it's alcohol. And it was never something I would think about that, oh, this thing I'm consuming, it's bad. It has destroyed lives before. No. Me, I was like, this is the drink of that day. You know, people are drinking, people are, I mean, it's it's normal, right? But um, later on, as life continued, I realized what is normal is not always what is best. And um, slowly by slowly, um, I did, I drank long enough in the nature that it became a problem. I would find myself, um, you know, like I would go to class, yes, but I would go to class with the intention of, okay, at this time, I go to class from this time to this time, by this time I'm out, so I'll be able to get my first drink in by this time. And literally, I would sit in my hostel room and just drink and black out, and for me, that was life, right? So, of course, campus ends because it doesn't last forever, like you might think. And uh, I found myself getting into working life, still having this problem. Now, let me tell you guys something. A lot of us in campus kind of think that, oh, it's fine. Uh, We'll drink. And then when we get, like when life gets serious, eh, we'll collect ourselves and stop drinking. But that's not how it works. By the time you've been drinking a certain type amount of alcohol for three, um, maybe four years, you'll find that you literally can't, your body on, in the natural cannot sustain itself. But in the spiritual, I had reached a point where alcohol was sustaining my positive energy. You know, my like joy it, in, in, in a very toxic way. So working life comes, I'm still struggling with drinking, and um, last year, see, at a similar time, maybe, I found myself actually um, having a liver disease. I was trying to quit for about a year or so, doing my best, guys. Eh? Like these things of your timing yourself, you don't want to have a free moment. You know, that thing they tell us about, I don't mind devil's workshop, you're trying, but it's not working. Um. And then when I got sick and I was told to go on bed rest, because when it comes to the liver, there's really not much you can do but wait and pray. I sat under the word and I was released. Amen. So I'll stop Mm. there for now. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, Jojo, your story. Did you always want to be a chef? Um, Yes, I've always wanted to be a chef. I knew since I was... 14, I think. Um, it was, I wasn't sure about it because I knew how taxing it was going to be, like on my body. I had, um, I had a lot of health issues growing up. Um, and so when I was embarking on it, everyone was like, are you sure about this? 
you think that you can do this. Um, and around the time before I went to college, there was the option of pursuing journalism because I'm a writer. And then there was the idea of pursuing culinary. And I was like, I'm comfortable with writing. And I remember God telling me, coming to me and said, but culinary is well, you will learn how to trust me. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. Huh? And indeed, it was like the worst three years of my life. But it was where I learned how to trust God. And so, yeah, I think it was always something I had to do. Okay. Ladies, that, you know, because both of you are dealing with consumption, but from a different angle. I'll start with you, <laughs> Mimo. Um, where is the spiritual side and the spiritual effect? What okay? What is the spiritual effect of alcohol on a person? Okay, so I think the best point to start is the fact that if you're a Christian, you know that there's God-given joy, there's God-given peace, there's God-given success. But the thing that alcohol tries to confuse us about is that it it comes in to try and be a counterfeit for God's joy. So you find that, um, because it appears easier to get, right? Like you go to a shop, you buy, you drink, yeah, done. Mm. But now with God's joy, to go into the house of the Lord, seeking his presence. Now for some people, and for most of us, you know, especially when, you know, you're young in the spirit, you, it, alcohol is easier. It's easier. It, it's more, you know, it's, re, it's more reachable. But also, the people around you at that time, that's what you see. Let's look at all the music videos. Everywhere you go, people are drinking and they are smiling and they are laughing and they are dancing. So what does that equate to in your mind? They're happy. But you see, it's a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit Which happiness. Means, that's yeah, what you're saying. It doesn't last. It's fake. So it like, you know, like with a fake bag. You buy a genuine bag, it's going to last. But what, what do you say to a person who, who says, um, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be a drunkard. You know, I, I just take a little bit of wine here and there. And uh, um, if I'm to take a UG... You know, it's just a, a sip here and there. I'm doing no one any harm. What do you tell that person? A person like that to me is like someone who's on the fence. Like, have you ever been there and you're like, you know what? I'm not inside that house. Like, I'm not jumping over the fence into someone else's compound, but I'm at, the f I'm at their fence. So, it's it, how do I put this? It's as simple as being pushed there. A small night, even if someone just shouts there at the gate and scares you, you end up in the person's compound. Mm. So that's the thing about alcohol. You know, they say the devil is like a roaring lion, you know, looking for who he may devour. When you decide to ha kind of entertain the presence of alcohol in your life, it's like you saying that, you know what, I am going to be around if he comes by. It's very easy for him to devour you because he, you have, there's, there's an entrance you've given him, kind of, mm. a leeway, a loophole mm. into your life. A foothold. Mm. Yes. Mm. But when you, when you decide that, no, it's the same thing. And it's really, when you look at it, it's like with most of the things that we deal with, if you kind of harbor and entertain something, um, maybe I'll say this for like the gentlemen who are married, you know, if you, for example, entertain someone, you're not doing anything with them, but you know they have a thing for you and they're just lingering around, right? Yeah, you will say you're not doing anything, eh? but how long will it be before you do anything or before someone is tempted to do something? So that's really um, my take on that. But your, your, view, your view on alcohol is totally different as a chef. <laughs> it's very different. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's very different. Like it's very different. I don't drink, mm. and I walk in a bar. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I spend so much time with people out partying, having a good time, and I realize I, I, I realize that people who have issues with drinking really have not taken an inventory of themselves and what they can and can't handle. Um, I don't drink because I knew young, from an early age, it was just something that bothered the family. 
Mm. Like it was something that was around. Was it religious or? It was. It wasn't religious, but it was. It was. Um. It was an observation. Mm. Okay. We do not <laughs> consume alcohol well. <laughs> like it's not a thing. Like so many people have been taken up by it. Yeah. And when I started drinking, when we were young and would go out and we party, I was like, I don't like myself when I'm drunk. Mm-hmm. It's not something that. When I wake up in the morning, I'm proud. <laughs> like I'm like, mm-hmm. and I was like, there's something here. But when you go out more and you're with your friends, it's a sh- it's a social thing, and everyone is doing it. And that's the I always say, Ugandans are going to die from. We are already here. <laughs> like mm-hmm. since we are already here, we're all doing it. Let's just keep going. Um, I had to like take myself out of the fold and be like, I'm very focused on becoming the person I want to be, and this is not it. And it was very hard when I was young, where I was like trying to figure myself out and like create that stamp and say I don't do that. So you had your own standards that yes. you set up. Maki. Yeah. Nice. This is an interesting uh, session. Drink and food that combination if yeah. it was practical not the alcohol bit but <laughs> if it was practical it would have been much more fun but yes it's going to be more fun because I want to bring up a scientific and spiritual approach to both worlds. Okay. And I'm glad that when you guys were speaking you hinted on that because then others had been on an island but alcohol i did some research in preparation for this and i found that there is a big school of thought that believes the word alcohol has actually an arabic okay uh founding origin yes. and yes what it meant was it, it came from the word alcohol alcohol which means body eating spirit okay now not like those uh, stories that you you hear of a monster and whatsoever but ideally what they're saying is when you look at the essence of alcohol the way it behaves okay it's supposed to extract the essence of something and this is why even in medicine it's used to sterilize things and stuff like that because it's supposed to take out something mm. now what people don't understand is that when you consume alcohol if it's doing this in the physical then the question should be what is it doing from to you from the spiritual perspective uh. and this is where what you guys have talked about comes in because it's going to create a portal something that uh, rabbi just thought about the on friday mm. it creates a portal because then it creates an environment that was not meant for your soul to exist in and so now your soul has to find somewhere to exist but it cannot be in this same environment So it's there but it's far back it's far behind and so what the environment that has been created is now for evil spirits or spirits which are not invited to come in and that's why everybody who ends up being drunk unless otherwise the results you know of drunkenness are always on the negative there's nothing positive about it and so even when you even biblically wake up, even, yes, biblically, even yeah. biblically yeah and that's why when you wake up like you're saying in the morning you sit back and say but I didn't do that. I don't like what happened because that wasn't ideally you. It was another being inside you operating through your body which is literally a vehicle. You understand? But just before I throw it back to Rabbi, for me when I was listening to your stories, when I look at alcohol and the spirit of man, it affects your frequency. Okay? And when I look at food and the spirit of man, it affects your vibration. You understand? So when you're taking alcohol and you're intoxicated, okay, it will shut you off. And that's it. Only junk food to a certain level is what can try and shut you off, but it mostly affects your vibration because then when you eat you feel good and you feel happy and you feel that and whatever and it's positive you don't lose yourself because you've eaten per se. You still you can still identify that this is me. I know what I'm doing. but it just gives you a certain kind of vibe you know and for me so that's how i wanted to look at this world of drink and food just uh, for an introduction but you know because I, I, y- your story was so powerful because you 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 didn't tell us how long how long did you how long were you uh an alcoholic uh so i struggled with alcohol alcohol intake really for about I'll say five years from what age to what age I'll say 18 because you know 18 is usually where it 
from the most of the stories I have people I interact with, 18 is where it like flares up because mm. of the crowds you're in, you're entering so this peer pressure. dome. What you're you're like, what's what's what are people doing? What mm. have I been missing? You know, in the f- at home. But it you usually kind of the people who actually come to a realization, they come to a realization of it after campus that eh, mm. I'm hooked. You know, I'm in this bondage. Most times after campus. Now, the decisions made after campus, it's kind of, it's it's whether you get yourself out or you dig yourself deeper. Because you remember now you're making money. Now you're, you're free. People are, some people move out of their parents' homes fully, things like that. So it's, it's that's around the time where I started to attempt to work through it. To work through it. But l- let, me, let me ask a question. So, I, I meet a lot of people who tell me um, I can handle my liquor. You know? Um, <laughs> it's, a <lie. laughs> it's a lie. It's a lie. Can we say then that if someone can't survive without a particular thing, mm. they, they are addicted to it? Because what we usually think is alcoholism is the effect that we see on particular people. So if I don't see you staggering, uh, you know, yeah. like a drunkard, so yeah. I conclude, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, but you see, the thing is, and alcohol has a different effect on everyone. And we're going to, the, the mm. actually, the, just to mm. add on to that, you're going to say, so what's the difference between the effect alcohol has on a person and mm. the effect drugs have on a person? Uh, I think when it comes to alcohol, first of all, people have they are different. There are people who can literally drink and just sit there. But the thing is, it's not always about what they are doing in the physical. What's yeah. happening in exactly. their minds? What's the exactly. decay? What are the thoughts yes. they are now entertaining? Yep. When you look at people who have eventually gone on to murder people, all of them had some sort of addiction. Mm. Serial killers from back then. Let's this. They recently made a Netflix documentary about uh, Jama. Jeffrey Dama. But when you look at his story, it started with alcohol abuse. He's there, he's abusing, he's drinking alone. Again, the loneliness, he's alone, he's drinking all the time. He has these seg- maybe sexuality wars within him. But all that is being dulled by alcohol, but allowing what to come up, right? Because you might dull your frustration, but what are you allowing now? And I need, to, I need to emphasize, as I bring these guys in, mm. I need to emphasize that we're not saying, and I have to make clear, so, for example, someone can be addicted to sex, mm-hmm. but sex is not evil. Yeah. yeah. Eh? Someone can be addicted to alcohol, but it's not that alcohol mm. is evil. But there is a spirit mm. yeah. that creates an addiction to something. Exactly. And that's that's what we're <laughs> actually trying to yeah. deal with. Uh, actually, before I bring in mm. Maki, because mm. I know you, uh, this is very interesting, because when we had a discussion, mm. um, and then we're going to bring in your food, eh? but when we had a discussion, you said something that I found interesting. You said that um, there are types of people that get addicted. Yeah. Okay, so everyone can drink, mm. but it's a particular type of person that gets addicted to drinking. Mm. Mm. And uh, uh, the same is true with drugs. And also the same is true with food. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. so so tell me about that. I think it, it's very interesting. So I think for me, again, I'll put a disclaimer because these are my personal observations. You know, and yeah. Observations. Yeah. Yeah. That um and like what she was saying that you know dependency, I do think there are particular personalities that are more inclined to be dependent on certain things, yeah. forms of yeah. you know drugs. So for example, um I found that people who do, for example, cocaine, tend to have an anger inside of them that's just there. Mm. But and you can't tell because these are not things where you're going to say, that, hey, those people, that person is loud. They have an no, but they are there. Those inner internal battles they have. Mm. Um, I also tend to find that people who tend to be dependent on alcohol are people who have a lot of. They have a lot. They would say they could say not necessarily from a shy perspective, but more from a pain perspective. perspective. Mm. So, so they're going through something. They are going through things, but they can't talk about it. That's why, if you notice, there are certain people who, when they drink. They tell you their issues. Mm. Mm-hmm. They tell you things they are breaking down over things that happened yeah. three, four years ago, but they they haven't had an avenue. You know, these are people, they might even have very huge responsibilities in their day-to-day life, so they don't have the leeway to just... An outlet. Yeah. 
um maybe just to mention one more people tend to get addicted to what i think people call weed those people normally are people who just want kind of the noise to stop mm. like they just want to be there they ne- by the a person who does weed they'll never tell you their problems problems yeah they're different uh, from the alcoholic yes yeah. for them they just want to be high and be there yeah. they want the world <laughs> to stop moving to stop having so much going on and just be there <laughs> Maki. yeah this this is an interesting discussion by the way what I'll contribute to this is and again me I just I love picking on on, on the conversation because the fact that you bring up that in terms of there is something else that is causing this trigger of addiction okay we've made it clear addiction is not a bad thing it's just what you're addicted to yeah. okay and what you can be addicted result? to jesus yes you can be addicted <laughs> to prayer you, okay, yeah. you can be addicted to your wife or yeah. your husband that's nice that's uh-huh. a good addiction but the ultimate goal okay and now if we go back to the introduction that i gave of it affecting your soul and we look at this that alcohol is doing it's basically affecting and influencing the functions of your soul part of the human okay so your speech your thought your like all these emotions and stuff like that that's the soul part of you i think for me the thing the, the question that somebody who finds himself in such a situation should be asking is why is this seeming to be a solution one avenue for me to be able to do what i cannot do naturally because this is how the devil operates he'll give you and this is what you said he gives you a counterfeit he gives you something that feels like that seems like so if you cannot express yourself freely like you're saying you can't talk to people freely and whatsoever look don't stress it just take a little bit of this you'll get the momentum that you need and now you can speak confidently and stuff like that but the ultimate goal is not for you to have the confidence and speak it's to get you hooked and then he comes to steal kill yeah, and, destroy. and destroy so the introduction your first drink is the stealing bit the pickpocketing mm-hmm. which has started you know because everybody who is a drunkard started with first someone the one bottle the moment you picked up that first bottle you were knocking on that door you know and so that's uh, you you had something to say <laughs> Um yes it's like it's the same thing with food. Yeah. Um most people eat even when they're not hungry because the mouth is a pleasure center. Mm. Um and it's why you're eating. It sometimes mm. it's just to have fun, you're just the food is luxury mm. to some people, so it's just enjoying flavors, enjoying the ambiance, bringing people together. But the same thing with alcohol, it's like why are you picking up the drink? Mm-hmm. Right? So mm-hmm. People when you're out with them they'll tell you don't drink if you're depressed or if you're sad mm. because first deal with that because then that will be a way for you to deal with your depression. Like you said a lot of people that drink are more depressed, a lot of people that smoke are more anxious. And that's the same thing with food. Most people eat mainly because it reminds them of something. Mm. Reminds them of a time when they were comforted by their parents. I always say people's dish, favorite dish, has something to do with like a mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, has, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, because everybody's mother is the best yeah. food. So, yeah. Or a grandmother. Yeah. So it's if you can recreate it, it's not about mm. the ingredients of the dish. It's yeah. about trying to recreate that moment for them where they feel taken care of and nurtured and loved. So. Even if you do it completely poorly, they'll be like, "This is the best dish ever," and you're like, "No, Bambi, it's not." <laughs> it's like you mm. just feel that there's this attachment that you have now to this environment, and yeah, so that's the thing about pleasure. You know, you know, let's 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 look at the Bible for a moment. Mm. Um, people think food is just food, but from from a biblical perspective, yeah. uh, if you go to the Book of Genesis, the purpose of food and drink was not. F- to quench thirst or hunger mm-hmm. because Adam and Eve were not hungry and thirsty in the garden of Eden mm-hmm. and yet they could pleasure themselves in eating and yes, drinking, and drinking yeah. so the the true essence of it was was for pleasure mm-hmm. and if you look at the fruits in the garden of Eden uh, there was a tree of knowledge of good and bad that had fruit okay mm-hmm. uh, you have the tree of life that had fruit and from that we can we can we can get the implication that there were other trees of hope of joy and so on and so forth that means many of these things and you know when the fall occurred these foods that god had created 
they everything on earth lost its true nature because of the mm. fall. Mm. But there's still those invisible ingredients that God put in in food mm. that we receive. That's why there's something you can eat that can help your memory. There's something yeah. that you can eat that yeah. will give you strength. Mm. Yeah. Okay? So it's it's a dimmed version. Correct. But it's still in there. Now, this is very important because um what you eat is uh, is important. Mm-hmm. But uh who cooks uh-huh. is just mm-hmm. as Come important. On. Come on. Yes. <laughs> true. Yes, yes. yes. True. As what you eat. And you're a chef, you yes. know this. Eh? Yes. But people don't realize that actually we pass on essence mm. into things. Yeah. Okay. The reason why I would love my mom's food is because there's an invisible ingredient that is passed onto it. It's not like you said, the ingredients. So if if I'm angry with you and I cook food, mm. it will not taste the same. Yeah. And you told me this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, that's Because yeah. you're, 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 you're a professional. So chefs are taught to, uh, to uh, you, you'll tell me, so they're taught to provide a particular dish in a particular way and to provide a particular, they're looking for a particular taste. <laughs> and, you, and we'll talk about, because when we were talking about this, she told me how, um, and I watch sometimes, if you've watched, there's a movie called The Menu. Mm-hmm. It, oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, 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 um, there are people who eat food to eat. Yes. Oh, oh, um. yes. <laughs> then there are those who eat food to taste it. To yeah. Tell us yeah. more about that. And also add on to the fact that essence can be passed out to food if you can. Mm. Yes. Um, well, it depends on how, like, upbringing is very important, right? Um, it depends on how you are taught to look at food. Most people mm-hmm. are taught to look at food as, as fuel, yeah. right? It wasn't about taste. It wasn't about anything. It was about this is what we can afford. This is what will give you strength for the next day. And so when you go out with people, you, you see how they eat. Yeah. So you, yeah. as a chef, you can tell. Yeah. When someone is just eating taking for what? For fuel. Yeah, for fuel. Because yeah. if I, you, you sit down with someone and they're just eating and they're like, they're just trying to finish their food, you're like, oh, okay. And most times you'll find they either went to boarding school and things were rough and <laughs> tough and they had to eat at a quick time. <laughs> and you're like, okay, this person is not going to taste any Anything. flavors. Yeah, the true. only critique they'll have yeah. is the food hot. Is it a lot? Mm. That's it. Um, yeah. And then. I know a few people <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> the food must be hot and a lot mm. and we move. Um, yeah. Then you meet people who were taught to look at food differently. Like most of their family functions were out at a restaurant or they had like treats where their parents would bring them something to eat. Mm. They look at food as a good time, yeah. right? So they take their time when they're eating. They enjoy the the flavors, the textures. It's not about whether or not it's just hot or not. Yeah. Um, it's also not about the amount, right? Yes. It's about the quality. And that's why, that's why when we watch most of these chef shows, they, they put... Fine dining. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing about fine dining. It's um it's small portions of yeah. like high quality food. Correct. So it's not about you getting full, mm-hmm. it's about you experiencing Enjoy. something. <laughs> There's a chef who like he has a whole course where it's like a pillow with like basil, <laughs> like it's just powdered. And you if you can't smell, you can't taste. And so for him it's just trying to involve all your senses. Mm. It's a whole experience. It's a show. It's right. an art. <laughs> and there are very few people who can actually enjoy the art of food mm. and mm. enjoy it and see it as a luxury. Um and so yeah, but even when it comes to who has cooked, in the kitchen we have um we have different talents. Like we have chefs who are like grill masters and people who are like very good at precision. Um, a past- I'm a better pastry chef than I am culinary chef, and mm-hmm. I hated that. <laughs> like I hated that because I'm slow. <laughs> like, and mm. it takes time to create a pastry product. You'll make a croissant for three days. Um, croissant for three days. Because yes. <laughs> you're going to. Like, yeah, um, a croissant is like this side. <laughs> I know. <laughs> three days. <laughs> yes. Okay, go on. Yeah, so you're going to do like the lamentation process. Put it in the fridge. Bring it out. Do it again. Put it in the fridge. It yeah. takes so many hours, but. At the end of the day, you, the last thing you want to do after you've cooked for three days is have someone just swallow the food. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, right. without, without going through the experience. I made those layers. Come on. So that's how it is. So when we're in the kitchen and you see everyone's talents, it's it's coming from something inside them. Yeah. Um, grill masters are very good with like fire and temperature control. 
and for them to be in a place where you're in like heated environment they just they just have this feel about like meat and how it should be marinated and how it should be and it's usually the most i want to say in the nicest way the most unstable human beings really? <laughs> and like it's the most unstable Ever. very yeah i always say that if you would find that most chefs a lot of chefs like in high industry they survive on cocaine because it's an mm. upper wow cane coffee energy drinks mm. right that's for me it was just energy drinks and coffee mm. but most of them it's it gives them the energy they need to be in a hot very heated environment people are yelling orders you're moving so when you find a grill master who can work in that environment there's something wrong with him in the outside world mm. that he can function so well in inside inside that and he can actually manage to get meat not to be dry but to be flavorful and have the perfect so when you sit down and you talk to them you'll find that they are very jittery people yeah. like mm-hmm. they they like when things are intense and heated and and you're like oh so good phone the perfect place to put you because outside you would have been like diving why, why out of would, why would they do drugs and not alcohol say for example alcohol slows you down okay mm. okay it it makes you sloppy and lousy and when you're in the kitchen you have to be exact they say it's an exacting art so even when you're working with knives you can't be sloppy you're going to lose can't. a finger but you have to be sharp and alert because i gave someone the scenario of like this is what a kitchen looks like you have 17 orders coming in right everyone is responsible for different parts of one meal right mm. so when the head chef is at the pass yelling i have five steaks three medium rare two well done i have potatoes mashed potato and he, all of us are, we have to hear what's happening so i can't say oh what did you say you know i just have to keep going so if you're in the hotter section of the kitchen mm. and you hear five medium um five medium steaks too well done you can't do anything you just have to start walk move um and since everyone is working in sync if you fall off you're responsible for that plate going bad wow so you have to be <laughs> alert you have to be quick you have to be exact or you're going to get yelled at and you're on your feet for 18 hours so you get where the the need to be it's not normal it's not a normal so so, so becoming a sh- chefs don't have a life li- literally they don't <laughs> not that that sounded like a war room experience like, <laughs> exactly. all, all that pressure and what you have all those commands that's like a, a typical control room you know when you're in a hot zone mm. in a red zone that's how everything everything happens but you see when when we're talking about people passing on essence of food you know the, th- the interesting thing is all of us have experienced that or we've had yeah. people when they've actually said for example when people make statements of this food was cooked with love mm. Mm. you know and when they say that <laughs> what they actually mean is it tasted so nice that there's just something about it and then there are times when you can test the same person's food mm. and this can only happen when like like she's saying when you're attentive to it okay and and you can actually engage your test buds okay you engage your whole emotions in it and you you can tell when something is off that this food is off and that's how sometimes you can actually tell if let's say if you're a married man and you eat your wife's food just to be clear you can tell that she wasn't the one who prepared this food mm. or she's not feeling well yes. okay yes me yes. and my wife have we we talked about this and we just agreed you understand just for the peace of everyone because I'm a creative and I'm mm. going to come to that and how chefs I believe fall in that world and, and you love to cook as well eh? yes. yes i said if we have a fight let's just agree don't waste your time to cook food because i'm not going to eat it why because i know it's not going to be coming from a place of that genuine love you understand so you'll just be doing it out of responsibility because i have to do it you understand because what's going on in your mind is eventually transferred into the food into the and food. when i eat it i don't want to have effects that i never fully understood mm. you know so for us that was just the understanding but it's coming from the place of essence can be passed on to food now coming to the part of chefs and being creatives i picked that up when you're speaking because for me it seems like this food and drink has something they 
they seem to have a strong attachment to creatives per se. That's true. There's, there's a strong attachment to creatives when it comes to food and drink. Because what you're explaining in terms of how chefs on the outside world, it doesn't seem like they are normal per se. That's the challenge that every creative goes through. Because most times they're operating in a world that can seem different from the normal world that people are used to. So they need a particular environment mm -hmm. to bring out the best mm -hmm. of themselves. And when we don't understand that, and that's why we're saying it's important to know what it is you're consuming, what mm -hmm. it is you're eating, because ultimately it's going to shift your energy somewhere. It's going to direct your creativity or whatever it is that you are destined to do somewhere. Robert, I want to ask, just before you pick up, for people who, let's say, say, okay, guys, I hear you, I'm watching the podcast, that sounds fine, okay, okay, but you guys don't get it, okay? I'm a creative, I'm an artist. When I take certain kind of drinks, spirits, just little, it gives me the psych I need to even become more creative. You understand? So where is the evil in that? Where is the wrong in that? I'll throw that to me. You'll throw that to <laughs> me? Okay. So I think with me, um, you know, for something like that, the main question would be who gave you that talent, mm. right? That's was powerful. It the, mm. Mm. Was it the drink? Was it the creator? <laughs> Come on. So I think nice. at the end of the day, I realize that a lot of people, you know, like he said, creatives, we face pressure. And by the way, just because creatives can look like, hey, we are chilling, what creatives have pressure with that client with that deadline. Hey, you see him there, he's just, it's because he doesn't have anything to put there, but it's not that he doesn't feel the pressure. So, what I would say for a creative is really depend on the one who gave you your gift. Don't look for a counterfeit thing that will end in tears. Because it's not the one that blessed you with that thing. So it cannot sustain it. Mm. Mm. God sustains what he has given. If he has given you a gift, he will sustain it. Not the drugs. Yeah. Okay, so so before I ask, does anyone want to add to what he asked? Yeah, um, I understand when you need a little fuel to what you're doing creatively. In a lot of ways, when we are trying to create who listen to music. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In the early stages of my walk, there were things where I couldn't listen to secular music mm. because it would interrupt um, how I had God. Nice. Mm -hmm. And it would interrupt the atmosphere. And I was trying to create and keep an atmosphere of God. Now that I'm grown, I listen mostly to Afrobeats uh -huh. <laughs> before I go to work mm. because I know that they generate, like, I can still hear God within that environment. Nice. Mm. Like, I can... Come on. Come on. Um, <laughs> I, Nothing can distract me. We can be in the middle of a club and God says, by four, please leave. And I'll be like, okay, at four, I'm going. And I feel like there's no place now that I can't hear God. So there's nothing I can be more dependent on mm. than God. So now it just comes about, it just, it when you're trying to encourage a flow, mm. right? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, a little whiskey is fine. I don't drink mainly because that's my agreement with God. But I understand what whiskey does. Sure. It helps with digestion. So it does wine. Um, I understand that for like, some like how, like, Let me ask, how much whiskey would help in a, in a digestion? Say, if I've just had a heavy meal. Yes. Yeah. Um, like one glass. Okay. Yeah. So if someone takes a second glass, it has, it's the, the reason for digestion has come to <laughs> it an end. Has had, but now <laughs> it can be, it can be just, <laughs> you are supposed to enjoy <laughs> this life. Yeah. It can just be just enjoyment. Uh -huh. you, it's nothing that you are emotionally attached to. Okay. It's just enjoyment. It's mm. like the same way we wear nice clothes or have a nice car. It's not that my whole life is dependent on this. It's just, and, and it's a pleasurable experience. Yeah. But also know when to cap it. Yeah. Right? And, and, that's, and that's where I think a large percentage of the issue is. And I yes. remember I had a discussion with you about the strategy because you see the people, especially within um, the area of alcohol and maybe drugs as well, but specifically alcohol, the people who, the companies that are selling mm -hmm. these things, eh? mm -hmm. um, they are looking to make money. And so they need more people to drink and the more mm -hmm. people that are addicted, yes. the, the, the better. The better they take. And you said there's a strategy they came up with. Um, you talked about cider. Just... Uh, mm. 
I wouldn't now when it comes to the strategy, I wouldn't say that because you know in life sometimes the things we are doing have a huge ripple effect in the universe mm. but as we are doing it just to let's cash in let's yeah. make profit yeah. that's what but what i see these days is that a lot of us really are using um you know alcohol as a status symbol mm. as a, as 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 a mark of achievement we are using it to celebrate things as if you're not already high on the joy of achieving the thing but mm. you see eh, like we are it's being it's being used to tune people in a way that ah it's used for joy ah if you if you are at a party it has to be there if it's not at the party what what do you mean it's a party it's a sign of wealth <laughs> it's you're a going sign to a billionaire's house and uh-huh. there's like a, a cabinet there with you know whiskies or wines as old as when but the reality is that um those are not supposed to be the things that make you feel like you've achieved something mm. those are not supposed to be the things that me like she was saying fine there are certain things you get yourself for pleasure let's say oh um in life when i achieve this i'll want to buy myself a rose royce or something like that but the thing is now they are being attached to things that we face in our everyday life let's talk about people who say oh when i've had a hard day i need a beer mm. right that's your everyday life some mm. people have extremely stressful jobs you'll find them that every day they are drinking and this is what happened to me it wasn't the job but because i drank every day i did it enough in the natural that it became a spiritual problem. thing yes okay mm. yeah mm. yeah mm. so now when it comes to like the lighter drinks eh, people are really trying to romanticize alcohol something mclean said is how um alcohol leaves way for spirits has anyone ever asked themselves why the harder forms of alcohol are called spirits to begin with but more importantly now people are dial- dialing it down to like 5% what before you know it people will be taking s- minimal amount of alcohol in juice now when it becomes an everyday thing remember it will no longer what happened with me was i started with beers but you can only take so many beers after some time you move to the harder spirits after that you know you have to you, like you have to keep going that's the thing about it especially for us who are chasing something who are dependent on it we felt we feel the need to keep going to get higher and higher and higher but at the end of the day the way i see it the strategy right now is the younger they are hooked the longer they drink and you're talking about these lighter drinks like uh, give us an example uh savanna yeah. yeah there are drinks there are yellow drinks uh <laughs> ha- like They don't so they're sweet and they're and they're sweet they're sweet mm. yeah like minimal alcohol so minimal eh? yeah. but the thing is eh, that minimal alcohol for a kid of like what 17 18 it will just push them into more yeah. remember we know this now because at least for myself I'm now in my late 20s but someone who is just starting campus they don't understand that jazz yeah. or by its what it's just peer pressure and looking for it's okay it's just five percent why in fact it's three percent in fact yeah, uh, <laughs> but before you know it you're hooked yeah and and you have friends like that huh yeah no 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 you can you can oh yeah um yes yes i do but more importantly i think for me i look really lower mm. i try to look lower because the older people it starts from yeah. yeah they know at this point sincerely speaking with all the things you've seen eh, yeah. you know but there are kids there are people who don't know like they've never seen a drunk person and if they have they assume that ah, this person they don't know the, you know they, because that's what i used to assume whenever yeah. i would see like really drunk people on the street when i was young i'd be like ah, what an irresponsible person you know <laughs> <laughs> like you're there you're thinking these things but the thing is you don't know the bondage eh? yeah. that you eventually get in so for me the way i see it you'd rather leave it mm. and know that there is no room for it to become bondage mm. than for you to have it there in minimal doses but with a window for it to become bondage and it's that window i'm going to use to bring in my point mm. <laughs> which is <laughs> which <laughs> which it was right there I just had to make use of that <laughs> like it was right there so now they are selling alcohol and saying oh yeah we understand 
it's addictive and let's really try and be part of the solution. So let's turn it down. Let's make it 5%. But the reality is they're actually not doing that. They're never going to turn it down. What people don't understand is it's just like when you're in business. No one gets in business having an opportunity to expand and sees what this can do and says, you know what? I can see what this can do. I think I'm just going to wake up tomorrow and close shop. No one does that. So there's a strategy behind it, which is part of the marketing, but mm -hmm. also when it comes to the future of alcohol. When we are talking about the future of alcohol now, it's moving towards psychedelic drinks. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, less of the natural feel addiction. Mm -hmm. Because ideally, they understood, and this is what was hooking people, that it made you feel a certain way, gave you a certain kind of vibe and stuff like that, okay? And that's what keeps people going back to alcohol because it gives you that. Now, the world came up and started making noise, like for smoking. People mm -hmm. started to make noise. Oh, no, it's killing people. It's causing mm -hmm. addictions. They said. Remember the advert for Bell? Bell will make your night and your <laughs> morning. will be bright. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Your morning. You know? <laughs> you know, so... People started to complain and said it's killing people and stuff like that. They said, oh, okay, okay, let's tone it down. And they introduced something else. It's mm. what's happening to the alcohol industry. Mm. So 5% is what is introduced now. But in the background, what they're doing mm. is they are improving psychedelic drinks. And how do psychedelic drinks operate? It's the same thing. You you know of uh, uh, Ayoska? Is yes. It? Yes? Mm. Okay. Ayoska so drug, eh? Yes. So those psychedelic drugs are what are now going to be infused into drinks drinks so now it's no longer going to be an alcoholic mm. drink it's going to be something else but which will still have the same effect like mm. alcohol had mm. which again like we're saying is still targeting your soul mm. not the pleasures it's giving you the ultimate goal here for the enemy is just your soul so whichever way he's going to approach it it's going to end mm. up on your soul mm. and that's why the bible says well, that's why God talks about gluttony, mm -hmm. greediness. There's a reason why he's going for the extreme yes. of things. And that brings me to what I want to understand. Because we've said a little drink here, a little eat here is not bad. Mm. But the Bible talks about drunkenness, yeah. mm. not drinking, mm. drunkenness, and then being greedy, mm. gluttony. Mm. So my question is, from the spiritual perspective, where is the mismatch or the error when the food that is supposed to give us pleasure, that's supposed to make us experience life better and help facilitate, you know, our body in this natural world, where does it cross from, okay, this is acceptable and this is now going at overboard what, at, and it's at going what to point affect. is it gluttony yes at what point because <laughs> we've we've exhausted for when it comes to alcohol it's quite clear uh. everybody can see okay i think here that's where the problem mm. is i want us to talk about the food so for me it was understanding why god needed to be the center of things he wanted to have your heart before anything mm. else i always say that some of these things are in pursuit of oh, your no, heart no. um <laughs> god wants your heart and the moment he knows that he has your heart, mm. none of these things can affect you. Mm. Um, I always, I told my friends that the only um, dependency I had was on coffee. Mm. Like I can't wake up and not have a cup, like a cup of coffee. Like I need coffee. And then I went away with them for like a couple of days, mm. and there was no coffee in the place that we were at, and I was fine. Mm. I was completely okay for days, and and I was like, you know, I've not had coffee in days. And I'm fine. Mm. I guess I'm not dependent. And I remember God saying, said, because it doesn't have your heart. It never did. Mm. It was just... A mental thing, maybe? Yeah, it was just a mental thing. Mm. And it was... I was worried that that was the only thing I had dependency. But okay. because I'm so dependent on God at this stage in my life, that everything else I can enjoy, mm. but if it's not there, it's fine. Mm. Like, I don't need it. Um, and that's where all these... Dependency. Mm. People reach for food because they need it. They need the what it offers them, the comfort. Yes. I feel good when I'm eating. Mm. Um, when I go out with my friends, I feel this is just where I love food. I love mm. bread. It just makes me happy. And that's where gluttony comes in. Mm. Where 
throughout the day, each time they feel bad, any time they feel stressed, they eat a snack, mm. they go to the fridge, they do so, and it becomes this this crutch almost to run away from whatever is making them feel yeah. mm. sick. So yes. it's it has their heart mm. <laughs> because if mm. you were to take it away from them, it would be like a proper heartbreak. Mm. It would be like they are really going through the worst heartbreak of their life mm. and it will be towards food either alcohol either drugs and when you know that something has your heart you know that leaving it is going to be the worst pain you felt but mm. let me ask as a professional chef does has it affected how you look at food and how you eat it yes <laughs> mm. very much so i don't eat food as much as i used to mm. because First of all, I feel like my palate has changed. Um, and because I'm around food all the time, and good food, <laughs> might, might I add, because mm. there are always people cooking, it became normal. It's just, like when I go to a restaurant, I'm not like, ooh, ooh. It's because I know how it's made. I can do it at home. It's fine. Um, and I realize most people, when they like like the a way a restaurant cooks their food, is because they can't recreate it at mm. home. It's not something that they have on an everyday basis. I have access to food mm. all the time. So in your course, <laughs> your course was there a health kind of side? Uh, uh, what should I call it? Module. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Huh? Yes. Health yeah. and safety, yeah. environmental awareness. Um, so you're taught about healthy foods. Yes, like food and nutrition. Now, going back to the essence of food, I found that people pray f- when I was in culinary school. I found that people pray for food wrong. Uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, let's go. Now we're talking. <laughs> so now we're talking. When we sit down at a meal and all of us grab our hands and we're like, "Oh, let's pray for food," mm. everyone is like, "You said the same prayer." And yeah. It's prayer without spirit. Come on. Mm. Um, food is medicine in a yep. lot of ways. In oh. ancient, <laughs> yes. in ancient culture, food is medicine. Yep. So a lot of the food that you consume how it's cooked and how it's consumed can actually fix and solve a lot of things in your life. Yes. So when you're praying for food and you're not actually instructing it on what to do when, mm. it's, mm. Mm. when it's in your body. Yes. Mm. It's very wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so wow. I I felt like I didn't need to pray for food when it was at the table because I was just like, eat. Mm. And I realized when I'm cooking, I'm like, I hope I'm not cooking out the nutrients. Father, yeah. show me how to make this the best, like, possible especially like when you're cooking things like there's a superfood called quinoa quinoa is has like slow release energy throughout the day and you can i eat want to <laughs> jump in already man <laughs> huh? so when you're cooking that you want that to be at its full fullest effect yeah. to help you throughout the day um and most people don't do that they just eat like they just cook and it's it affects your life in a lot of ways there are foods especially in uganda that have the ability to heal um, liver issues, to heal, ki- mm. heal kidney issues, even cancer, to, like reduce the symptoms. So a man of God doesn't have to come and lay hands. You can eat. <laughs> you can eat, <laughs> oh, and you can tell the food. Yeah. I know what you do. Yes. Mm. Come and do it for me. And people don't understand. It's <laughs> yes, I love that you took the, the the conversation in that direction, man. I I love the life of monks, mm. so mm. I've studied it a lot. And one of the things that I found they put a lot of emphasis on was food. And so I also wanted to understand why. And it's exactly what you're saying. Because there is nothing that God created that was dead. Correct? Everything has life, in essence. Mm. So if you eat something else, let's say a plant or an animal, in essence, you're consuming its life. Mm. The life of a thing is in its blood. Correct? Correct? And so when you're saying, for example, and we know this because even in African culture, this is why our great-great-parents and even some of our parents would give us herbs because Mm -hmm. they had those healing properties, okay? And that's why when you look at our great-grandparents, they lived longer. They had more healthier lives because they were still, you know, hooked on to the real purpose of food and Mm -hmm. what it could do. Now, I say that to bring in again the bit of greediness but also from where the food industry shifted that narrative and introduced highly processed foods Mm -hmm. that at the end of the day like you're saying the the more the food is processed 
They're less the natural nutrients. That's and so true. what are you eating? You understand? <laughs> it's, it's really nothing. It's just a lot of rubbish packed in your body, you know? I'd like to contribute to that, um, especially with my experience trying to recovering from liver disease. So one of the most shocking things is that, um, of course, they always tell us this is the uh, organ that regenerates. Yes. But the funny thing is the doctor, um, God bless his heart, he, he told me what we are going to do eh, is make dietary modifications. Now, at mm. first, eh, I was like, so I'm literally like, I'm, I'm on God's mercy, right? <laughs> but when he told me, I didn't understand it then, but listening to you and like recounting my experience, um, I was told, one, not to eat certain foods, mm. that they would put pressure on the liver. Mm. I was told um, to take wasp. Um, there's a concoction someone makes of wasp venom and honey. Mm. And that was something I was taking a big spoon of twi once in one big spoon three times a day. And apparently wasp venom has regeneration properties. So mm. it aids in regeneration. And then I was also told to take juice with pomegranate. Pomegranate juice like things eh, i had never heard of eh? <laughs> but they were he called them dietary modifications some mm. things were removed i was told not to drink milk nothing with fats and things like that and it that was literally my treatment yeah so i found that interesting when you mentioned that um especially with because with liver the liver you can't add more meds mm. because medicine puts um, strain a strain mm. on the liver that is already strained. So, with the dietary modifications, now I, I mean, I understand it more. What about the people who say, you know, we live, you know, I think about this. Uh, mm. People say, you know, I'm a child of God. Eh? God said, <laughs> no, uh, in the book of Genesis, eh? uh, you know, initially in, in, in the Garden of Eden, m if, if we study it, yeah, man was eating fruit. Eh? Mm. Uh, um, yeah, we don't have to go into it, but later after the fall, God tells Noah, uh, every green plant, as well as a flesh that does not have blood in it, you can eat. Eh? Mm. And God would not have to give that instruction if he had already given it to Adam. To Adam, he was told you can eat every green, but not specifically meat. Eh? Mm. And here we are, man is told, eat away as long as there's no what? Blood. And so there's some Christians out there who are like, but you're telling me this is bad for me, this is bad for me. I'm a child of God, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, I have the revelation of God. Eh? Um, whatever I eat will yeah. only give me strength. I will not yeah. fall sick in Jesus' name. What do you have to say to such a person? They are right. Yeah. <laughs> like they, are, they are very right. Um, everything that you eat has the potential to help you and aid you in some way. Mm. I feel like know the reason, know what it yeah. actually is has to offer you even like fast food you can say that this is just i'm just eating for for vibes just to eat yeah. mm. and and you know that but it can't be like where your main you know diet is so it's kind of just no and balance that's the reason why they teach us like um having a balanced diet mm. yeah. having a balanced diet and it encompasses everything in your life just be balanced strive for i balance. was shocked uh, um uh, my wife told me this that you know there are people who go when they're overweight, they'll go to gym to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And my wife holds the, the narrative <laughs> that you don't have to go to gym to lose weight. I, you I like your wife. She's I very right. <laughs> very right. Yeah? You see, you yes. That you just have to change the diet. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So there's food that can reduce your weight. Yes. Correct. <laughs> there's food and it's portion control. What they say, yeah. it's portion control. Eat anything you want. That's what the, the Chinese do. Mm. Anything you want. It's just in small amounts. Mm. Small amounts and time it throughout the day. Right, so most people don't even know how much they consume now. Like for alcohol, I tell people you're going to the gym every single day, right? Mm. You're burning all these calories, and you come and you drink a glass of whiskey that has like 58 calories. So you're just putting back the calories. What have you done? <laughs> like, <laughs> a lot of these spirits, alcohol is filled with calories, and that's the reason why when someone is like drinks beer, it's the equivalent of eating a loaf of bread. Mm. You have eaten a whole <laughs> loaf of bread in two beers, and you're wondering why you're putting on weight. <laughs> like it makes no sense. So you might as well not go to gym if you're doing. <laughs> you have done nothing. <laughs> you have done absolutely nothing. I and agree. Yeah. It's like no, how it's... people expect people who are addicted to alcohol to be small. 
Mm. But it can't be because they are putting in a lot of calories and surprisingly alcohol has a tendency to make you want to eat the greasiest most meat really. Eh? So that's why you find that a lot of people who have the means, right, and drink a lot in taking a lot of fast food. But is it true that the the impact especially of alcohol on women is different to the way it impacts men. You know, they used to say that, mm. um, you know, uh, if, if if a girl is being hard, just give her a little bit of... <laughs> and <laughs> Lowered inhibitions, and that's where it comes from. It's just lowering inhibitions. Um, I think men, are by nature, take risks. They're mm. always yeah. in that place. Women aren't. We're more cautious. So we always have our guard up because about the world, you know. Yeah. Like, mm. um, so... When you go to a bar, men will naturally just be like, "Hey, we go here, we move mm. this side." With this, women are like, "Hey, who's there? Are we coming? What How time? Are we, are we going home?" What? So if you if you find <laughs> that kind of energy already, you're like, ah, "One glass of wine, she's going to come down at mm. least about where we are going, mm. <laughs> how we are going there." So it just lowers the inhibitions of women because by nature we just have our guard up. Okay, nice. uh, Mark, you had something to. Yeah, me. I was just going to say on the initial point that you raised of when someone says I'm a child of God I can just eat anything well I'll still quote the same uh, Bible they're talking about the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge mm -hmm. <laughs> knowledge what we're discussing here is knowledge mm. you understand and I like the, the the point that she's making of at the end of the day it's really what you want mm -hmm. or what you want to achieve you understand and in doing that if you attach a certain level of consciousness to it then there are certain additions you don't need and that's the element of gym that you're talking about i can i i approve that message mm. okay mm. i approve that message <laughs> i'm a gym person i'm a gym instructor as well mm. so i approve that message you don't actually need to come to gym to lose weight mm. the food can do that the same way you don't need to come to gym to gain weight mm. Mm. when you come to gym what we're actually doing is helping you gain muscles mm. and tone your body mm. that's what we're working on not for you to pack weight you want to pack weight that's not our business. Mm. Mm. So it's it's just the lack of knowledge, yeah. you know, and how to apply it. And because even us, when we, when, when, for example, we're advising and, you know, trying to help people who want to pack some, some weight or some muscle and stuff like that, we also use the diet plant, specific foods and this and that and don't do that, don't do this. It's basically just playing with what you already have. You understand? So... I think for me, even as we are almost coming to a close of How this, because we're in already one, and one hour and five minutes, so mm. we have roughly 25 minutes. For me, it's just, it, it comes down to, at the end of the day, what you're consuming, what is it coming into? What void is it filling? Mm. What purpose is it coming in for? You know, and at the end of the day, you yourself, what are you trying to achieve? Because if you're in the, in the club, you know, the bandwagon effect of you're just doing things because other people are doing things, I think you need to check yourself. Actually, you need that, to that, have that, an identity that brings a very important you know? point. Eh? Because we said who cooks is important, what yeah. you eat is important, but yeah. also who you eat with. Yes. Mm. From a spiritual perspective is yeah. also important. You know, when Jesus was at, uh, uh, the Bible says in Matthew 26, 26, I, uh, I'll need to look it up. But he says, and so he's sitting with the, uh, the disciples at uh, the Last Supper. And he's saying, this is my body. Yes. And so he's, he's, he's eating with them. Mm. And the purpose of it is to create a oneness. Actually, mm. if you look throughout scripture, that if you eat with someone, the Bible says that uh, Saul, uh, Saul was looking for Samuel. Mm. So, Saul finds Samuel after, okay, Saul was looking for donkeys. Yeah. Finds Samuel. The moment Samuel, who knew who Saul was supposed to be, was supposed to be a king, the moment he sees him, he doesn't say, I've anointed you as king. He doesn't say that. Mm. The Bible says, he says, come and I will tell you the secrets of your heart. Then he takes him to eat. Mm. And he says, the Bible says, and he set apart for him a certain portion of meat. He set it apart mm. and told him, first eat, mm. then we talk. If you read the book of Daniel, uh, yes. The kids refuse to eat the king's meat yeah. because eating is deeper than what you 
perceive it to be. Uh, it creates a oneness. Mm. I know people who, okay, now they're Christians, but I know someone who was in the dark world and he said mm. one of the easiest ways to impact someone was, was you just sit with them and have a meal. Wow. Because there's an impartation that takes place with who you eat with. It's not just... <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> you understand? Eh? Yeah. And that's why the peer pressure thing is yes. also important. Because yes. there's that impartation that takes place when you're like with mm. your buddies and let's go and drink. Mm. Yeah. And as you drink, you start out okay. Mm. Then you start going into mm. it because of, you, you can add on mm. to that if you feel you have to. <laughs> no, I think, I think what came to my mind was two things. First of all, it's why... And I, I'm not saying impartation in the sense, but it's why, for example, when a guy wants to like talk to a lady, yes, he takes, he takes her out. out. To yes, eat. that's yeah. that's yeah, our secret. That's yeah, our secret. Yeah, now we know. <laughs> now <laughs> you understand. Yeah. It creates, it, um, yeah. it creates a, a bond. Mm. Yeah. Um, when I was in my like second semester, I hated cooking, and it was something that they told us. They were like, "If you love cooking, you're going to hate it very soon." Mm. And halfway, I hated it. I couldn't stand being in the kitchen. It was so much. Why do you hate it? Is it because of the pressure? Or? It was the pressure. It was the precision. It's like it's about skill. Mm. It's uh. not. It's no longer about fun. It becomes fun. an yeah. art now. Yeah, it becomes an art. Mm. It's about um, being precise with my cuts. Um, managing this. I'm um, creating the recipe. I'm being. I'm portioning things out the way they need to be portioned. So it takes the love away from it. It now just feels exacting. It feels like you're just... Mechanical. Yeah, too, mechanic. too much mechanics involved. So I hated it. I hated that way of cooking. And I remember going to God and saying, I'm going to quit. <laughs> I'm going to quit. <laughs> I'm going to quit this course. Um, and God said, find an, another reason as to, other than just cooking, find yeah. what food does for people. Come on. And I remember thinking, food brings people together. Mm. Before I even went to culinary school, everyone used to like just gather at my house for some reason. And they used to say, oh, Jojo likes to gather people. And it, I realized that's what I was doing by cooking. It's just something that brings people together. Everyone comes for like a meal, like at a date, family functions. Everyone's just like centered around like a meal that you just have with your loved one. This creates intimacy, creates memories. It's a bond that you have with someone when you share a meal with them. And I was like, oh, that's now what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm no longer <laughs> cooking. I'm bringing people together. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it brought me closer to God in understanding that that's how he is. He wants to be in communion. So I remember for like th a couple of weeks, three weeks, God would sit. I was alone in my apartment and he'd be like, have dinner with me. Just wow. have dinner with me. That's why there's a last supper. <laughs> Come on. Right? Yes, 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 yes. After the rapture. After yes. the rapture. Yes. Yes. That, that wedding supper of the Lamb. Yes. It's it, God is about food, man. Yeah. <laughs> you understand, eh? God is about food. But let, let me ask you something. Um, your profession is predominantly male. Mm -hmm. huh? sure. and, and, and it's interesting because women generally cook. <laughs> eh? okay, <laughs> you understand? Eh? But your profession is predominantly male. And uh, the, we've had discussions on this. And I'm curious, how have you handled? Because being a chef is different from just being a cook. Eh? <laughs> okay. Uh, a lot of chefs, like you've told me in the past, and you said earlier, have given up their lives. Yes. They don't have a social life. They don't have, okay? How do women handle? <laughs> How have you handled? Um, firstly, I don't think I would be in the industry if it wasn't for God. That's number one for me. Mm. Um, it has been a way for me to commune with God, to get closer to God. How other women handle is that you just have to be for lack of a bit, a hard line. Like, you know the kind of sacrifices that you're going to make when you're in there. Mm. Um, for men, it's easy, and that's why it seems like they dominate it. Someone said if um, women, if men found a way to make money from raising children, women would be kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing about cooking. Uh, men have found a way to make money <laughs> from the profession, and they're just at a place where they can make more sacrifices than women. Mm. It doesn't need to... You're working six days a week, 18 hours a day. Where, you go, where do you find time to see your kids? A man doesn't have to be there during bedtime, bath time. Mm. Yeah, he just has mm. to provide financially so he can... But a woman, we had um, a chef who had been in like the Olympics come and talk to us and she said, I my officer on Monday. And when my officer on Monday, I go, I pick up my child from school and I just spend the day with them because that's the only time. And it got to a point where she she or her husband had to quit. 
and her husband quit. Because for her, she got to the Olympics with her skill. For him, he was just a chef. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you know what, between the both of us, yeah, you're the one. <laughs> so yeah. one person had to make the sacrifice of like, when it comes to family, I'll be the one that's you do the crazy stuff that needs to be done. But that is not the truth for a lot of women. Mm. So even when you're in the industry and someone was trying to take you out on a date, you'd be like, can you do Monday at 2, a, 2 p.m.? I'm free for like two hours. <laughs> um, otherwise, on Sunday, I'm working. On Saturday, I'm working. And I'm going to work until like 12. And then, I, I don't know, there'll be like an activation on Monday. Then I, I don't know when I'm going to see How is you. the pay? It's very poor. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> it's very bad. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a nice way to end such an interesting. <laughs> Killed you what? My myth. Uh, you, what you th- <laughs> that's just so funny. I thought you guys were. Eh? The fade so highly. But what, yeah. what about you? Because you, you see, um, I, I find it interesting. When we were talking, uh, you told me something. No, actually, I don't remember who said what. But <laughs> but uh, I think it was me. I was saying, that when you see a lady drinking, uh, a certain type of drink, you're okay with it. But when you see them with particular <laughs> types, you're like, mm. it says some. You, uh. you kind of conclude that it says something about them. Uh. It's like it's like seeing a, a a woman smoking, especially here in Uganda, yeah. with a cigarette, Good. and you're just thinking, yeah. mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't do that. They're, they're presuppositions. Yeah, I would say that it's like it's something that, and back to actually like the personalities, right? Mm. There are certain drinks that I think in Uganda say something about a certain type of person. And that in itself is very problematic. Mm. I'm sure you guys have, anyway, I don't know, but you've had people who they say that, eh, man, that chick, she's a nail special chick. Mm. There are connotations you get. <laughs> there are implications. It's just that people have just left it there as a blanket yeah. statement. So what, what is a nail special chick? Like what? what? Man, that person, a chick with, first of all, high tolerance, because mm. that drink is not easy. That's why it's mostly men who drink it. It's mm. something with bell lager, right? Mm. Um, but then when you see, like, a chick drinking Savannah, you're like, a hey, bambi. Like, <laughs> yeah, to, like, Savannah chicks. So she's not in doubt. She's not in it. Mm. Now, when you see people who tell you that these shots, people who drink on Yuji shots, Waraji, tequila, yeah. what? Mm. This is a person who is out for a good time period they She's are not unsure chick. they yeah. are not what but you see all these things i think at the end of the day come back to what someone is trying to do mm. because those energies follow that thing there are women who <sighs> there's this thing where people would say that oh that chick she hangs out with guys a lot mm. now if you're looking for like a blanket description of a nail special chick that's the energy but the thing is that that's not what it would be called in another setting, in a separate setting outside of all the intoxication and whatnot. So what I would say is a lot of us, you know, there are these types of drinks that have certain implications or certain things they draw out. But um, I think it all goes back to identity. It all goes back to identity. A lot of us really... Now you see, just me... People saying, hey, that chick drinks Nilo. You hear a group of guys saying, hey, yeah. There is a young girl who's sitting there thinking, I want to have guy friends, more guy friends. Mm. Subconsciously, something is happening and they find themselves right. there. Mm. So at the end of the day, when you know, and not just knowing who you are that's earthly and natural, but just knowing who you are that now is being promoted of, ah, man, just know who you are. What kind of things do you like? <laughs> But there is that spiritual knowing who you are Mm. from the Bible and onwards to like Jojo's conversations with God, things like that. It solidifies you in a way that now there's no way you're going to be taken up by the bracket of a Savannah chick or a Nile special chick or that chick like shots. There's no way those things can now start. What what is considered a classy drink? (laughs) How about the whiskey? Wine. Wine, wine, champagne. Uh, no, not even a champagne. champagne. Huh? Not even a champagne. Um, it's going to be like a like a white wine, like a, I don't know, just a, a nice class. And wearing. what drink is like Cayola, like for <laughs> for everyone? Apart from water, like <laughs> in alcohol. Beer, beer. I would. Uh, huh? <laughs> I wouldn't say beer. Um, I would say something like vodka. 
Really? No. Yeah. No, 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 no. Tequila. Maybe in Uganda. Yeah. Maybe in Uganda. I feel like a nice, like a I tequila. I feel like gin. Gin, eh? Because isn't Waraji gin? Yeah. 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 I think, wa- because man, you guys, by the time you start Everybody. drinking Waraji, <laughs> if you I, I think, don't drink, I think I think the process of uh, making the drink mm. helps to categorize it. Uh, mm. uh, you, not, uh, you understand? So yeah. the less input, yeah, it's Kayola. The, the, less the art. more input, the more art, the more... You know, yeah. uh, the That's more a, a lifestyle point. is built around it, mm. it's, it's defined as classy. That's a point. I, That's I want to talk on the, the pay thing. Mm? Um, in the, our industry, the mm. pay. Mm. Um, the reason why I would say the pay is bad is because of how many sacrifices we're making. Yeah. Uh. That is the reason why the pay is bad. Um, but also, the reason why people are okay making those sacrifices is, like I said earlier on, they love what they do. Mm. And when you're that in love with something, it, you can make as many sacrifices to growing in it. Um, there's a chef that I love who says that to work with your hands, you're a laborer, but then to work with your hands and your mind, you're a craftsman. But to work with your hands, your mind, and your heart, you're an artist. Mm. And when you get to that point of this is an art to you, um, you don't need, this is your drug. This is your God. This is, and most people, when they're making those kinds of sacrifices, that's the altar. Like, that is mm. the altar at which everything is going to get burnt on. There's so much. <laughs> uh, uh, we, have, we have to wind this up. Eh? Yeah. But I, I, want, I, want to, I want you to, how did you, because you are an alcoholic, you're not an alcoholic anymore. No. How did you get out of that? Yeah. I think um, if I was one, um, I'm going to speak to different versions of myself. If, if I was younger, like 18, for sure, first of all, I would tell them, no, no. Like, and it doesn't matter how many people say that, oh, yeah, this person, they are the CEO of this and this, but you know, every so often they drink, it would just be a no. For so many reasons, my personality, uh, the things that I like to do, being a creative things like that but how i would say now after getting out of it i would say sitting under the word it is very difficult to fight a spiritual issue with natural methods um i'll take us to people who go to rehab they never get well yeah they go they get out they come back they go it's like it's it's a cycle People go for counseling. I mean, and I'm not saying that these ways completely don't work. Mm -hmm. But when the problem moves from the natural to the spiritual, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they will not work. They need Mm -hmm. spiritual solutions. They need spiritual solutions. Now, for me, I think what happened was I came into a season where I was forced to sit Mm -hmm. with the issue, just to be there. Mm -hmm. And in that time... um, um, one of my disciples was telling me, you know, this is your make or break point. Like after this could be the best season of your life or you'll just come out of it. And so I s- used that time to sit under the word. I'm talking three to four hours in the word per day. Sermons, then after that reading, then after that prayer. But this is something that was, at the time, I think God was setting a bedrock for it because by that time I had a disciple. Man, I was still wilding, but I had like accountability partners, right? Um, my fiance had also overcome it maybe one and a half, two years prior. But when the thing happened, the disease, I sat there. And I just sat under the wall. And it was no pressure. I wasn't telling myself, you know what? You're going to quit. When you come out of this, you're never going to do it. It's never going to come up again. Mm. What? It was like, that's not what we are here to do. We are here to sit under the word and hear what we hear. It just so happened that while I was in that process, I was being recovered and I couldn't see it. Like it is with the word. You don't know how. You don't know why. But it's done. And that's really all I can tell someone. You know, it's it's amazing because in all that I learned that you know God did it if you can't explain it. Yeah. 
and I can't. I can just say, sitting under the word helped me recover from something and then turn around. And he, as it says in, in I think, Romans, he works all things out for the good of those who love them. So he, to love him, and he, he turned it around for me to understand life much better, much faster, and to understand what is currently happening in the spirit when you intoxicate yourself. Yeah. And yeah, I'll just tell anyone that the word, the word, and the word. And you feel like God, you feel like um, you kind of found purpose and meaning through the experience that you went through. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Because at the end of the day, these experiences, you know, ugly as they may seem when you're going through them, they are in so many ways they impact who you are as a person and the beauty is that if it's in God it impacts you for your own good and for the good of others mm. because right now we live in a generation where anyone who ever tells anyone about how alcohol isn't good is a buzzkill like you're a buzzkill you're not like leave us as we are still young but mm. here you recovered which means you also enjoyed like there's so many okay. accusations <laughs> that come through but the most important thing is that um i think one thing we take for granted sometimes is that not everyone has a bounce back story out of alcohol mm. i can say there were so many nights where i drank drove and I honestly, I have no idea Good how I was okay. Because so many times, like at some point it was even on a daily basis in a certain season. But the point is that there are people who die while still even in the natural with this yeah, thing. That's true. Before it even becomes spiritual, there are people who die accidents. Yeah. Uh, somebody sees them living about looking high, kills them for what their wallet. So... At the end of the day, when mm. I look about when I look at um my journey and how far I've come, I don't really see that oh Banange, it's such a horrible thing. It is, but I also see that you know what? Eh? You can actually get out of it and have the life that you were supposed to have. Mm. Not a half life. Because I think that's the fear sometimes for people. They're like, huh. Now, me who has sunk 10 years of my life into this addiction and things like that, how do I get out? How do I become... Normal? God, God can redeem time. He yeah. gives beauty for us. What, what, yeah. what about you? Um, uh, would, uh, well, your final words. Would you encourage anyone out there to become a chef? I would definitely encourage a lot of people, especially in Uganda. Um, it is... Are a space that still has a lot of room to grow, um, even to the capacity of like making money from it. Mm -hmm. There are so many gaps, so many gaps um, in the culinary industry right now in Uganda. And we have a lot of food, <laughs> a lot of food and a lot of good food to work with. Believe me, there's a lot of good food to work with. And I, so I would encourage a lot of people to do it. It's, especially if you're creative, especially if you want a thrill, <laughs> if you want a thrill and if you want to take ownership of yourself as well because you need a lot of um, discipline. And is there anything else you would want to add concerning food before we close that we might have missed out from a spiritual or natural perspective? What's your favorite dish? I found out the other day that I'm very basic eh? when it comes to my favorite. My favorite dish is pizza. I love pizza. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> that is so it's so basic. <laughs> <laughs> it is an open face sandwich and mm. you can't get very few people okay. can get it wrong. Maki. Nice. Been an awesome session, man. Thank you guys. For me, I think just in closing it would be food and drink are nice. They're good. They're amazing. They were put here for a purpose and purposes like we've discussed. Mm. But at the end of the day, man shall not live on bread alone. <laughs> <laughs> so get to the word, soak yourself in the world, build your spirit, man, so that your soul will flourish, so that your body flourishes. You've stolen my scripture. Okay. Uh, I wanted to end with that. But let, 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 let me say it. So, um, Miriam Memo, thank you so much for coming. Josephine Jojo, God bless you. Maki, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the Bible says, taste and see. <laughs> that the Lord is good. <laughs> see you next time. Nice one.